What makes a great guitarist? Ability, creativity, intensity, charisma. Honestly, it's all the above. The 90s were filled with amazing guitarists that shredded their band's ways to the top. In a video where everyone watching will have a strong opinion, these are the top 10 best 90s guitarists. This list was made with a few rules. Number one, guitarists were considered under the rock alternative metal umbrella. Two, the guitarists had to have made their name and become mostly known as a big deal and the guitarist of a big band in the 90s. That means the huge names like Eddie Van Halen, Slash, even John Frusciante, who were all established in previous decades, won't be on this list. As awesome as they are. Three, this list is not meant to be a definitive, permanent statement for ranking the bands themselves. Also, this is just an opinion. It's not worth getting upset over, he says after knowing how upset people will get after watching this. As of this recording, only 32% of Rocked viewers are subscribed. Please hit that subscribe button. It's free and helps out a ton. You know how these videos work. Here are the top 10 best 90s guitarists. Many of you probably were not expecting to start with an entry like this, but put all your Creed jokes aside for one moment and realize just how strong of a guitarist Mark Tremonti is. Only making it big in the second half of the 90s, and Mark Tremonti stood head and shoulders over hard rock competition. The best proof of that is Creed's debut My Own Prison, because that album is filled with fantastic guitar work that gets overlooked because Creed is now a meme. Creed was trying to make something much deeper in post-grunge through the late 90s, and Tremonti's guitar work established that. There are several reasons why Creed dominated so much radio play from 97 to 99, and the success of Creed I don't think would have gone higher without Tremonti's solos and riffs throughout the end of that decade. The guitar work across the board was never made fun of. Whether it's the radio-friendly format of Human Clay or the more driven and experienced guitar work on My Own Prison, which I still feel is overlooked now, Tremonti deserves a spot on this list. Speaking of the late 90s... A man whose ever-changing face and image is always recognizable, and a man who is way too talented for the band he was playing in. Like Creed, you can make whatever jokes you want about Limp Bizkit, but no one can laugh at the creative riffs and performances from Wes Borland, who was the backbone of this circus. Limp Bizkit would not have survived or been able to have any argument for being a contender of a band without the rhythm and wild variation of riffs that Borland was able to make during the enlistable years of Limp Bizkit in the late 90s. Emphasis on listenable years. Turn of the century, things got worse, and when Borland left Limp Bizkit, they got much worse. Proof of the biggest talent in the band. It's the creativity and different flows that Wes Borland created which helped Limp Bizkit have a unique sound in a positive way back in the 90s. Even if I'm not a fan of the band, I could never deny the world-class skill Borland possesses. Borland's late 90s work was also at a time where nu metal was the big thing, so for him to stand out against so much talent also says something when he had to do it behind Fred Durst but Borlin always made sure he was heard in the music. It was in 1990 and the following 10 years that Zach Wilde went from being known as Ozzy's guitarist to being his own name and established master guitarist. Whether backing Ozzy or solo work, Zach Wilde earned his spot in the 90s as one of the best guitarists in the game. Take four 90s albums with Ozzy Osbourne, Pride and Glory release, and his huge solo album Book of Shadows. Then understand all that I just said happened in seven years. He worked and toured relentlessly and with the Prince of Darkness as well and somehow still came out alive and shredding for the better. I feel Wilde's best work, regardless of solo or with others, is in the 90s. You can hear how varied and truly impressive his solos were, and the range was massive. From high neck shredding to going off the rails with a solo and he just loses all senses because he's so into it, Wilde is iconic for stepping up front to the stage and working that guitar. Zach Wilde may not be a completely sane man. He's proven that in almost every interview he's ever done. He's also proven he's one of the best guitarists out there, and he's been proving it for years. Dream Theater is prog royalty, and John Petrucci is a big reason why the band became well-known in the 90s. I don't know how much of prog would have carried on past the 90s if not for what Dream Theater established and what John Petrucci was composing as a writer and a precise and lightning-fast guitarist. Petrucci said that his playing depends on a strong sense of synchronization between his two hands. That makes sense, but when you hear his picking and how his sync, his timing is with a seven-string guitar, it still doesn't do justice to how strong his riff ability is, especially over notably long track times. The double tapping and sweeping he could pull off instantly while keeping bonkers time signatures is something that should be studied by future guitar students that want to know more than the basics. In the 90s, a band like Dream Theater stood outside of so much popular music for being prog and metal, and that band had one of the best guitarists of that decade wowing audiences worldwide. Petrucci was a touch of prog metal class during a decade of grunge and new metal. He made sure this band and he stood out. 
Soundgarden already had some name value by 1990, but when the grunge explosion came and Bad Motorfinger was released in 91, Soundgarden was on their way to becoming a household name, and Kim Thale was the guitarist who made some of the best riffs of grunge and throughout the decade. An underrated name in rock history, Kim was a brilliant riff writer, especially when creating opening riffs that would lead into iconic moments like Black Hole Sun and Jesus Christ Pose. You always knew Soundgarden could kick the door down within the opening moment of a track, and that's because of Thale. So much of Soundgarden's tone and amazing atmosphere was because of what Thale was putting down from beginning to end. The way he could elongate riffs and bend strings to make new expressive emotions to match a powerhouse like Chris Cornell cannot be praised enough. A severely unsung hero of the grunge era and the 90s in general just because there were so many massive names and rock to come out at that time, but his licks and riffs are still as fresh sounding as 30 years ago. When you think about the visual and experimental side of alt metal, along with the unhinged side of what guitar playing can be, Tool checks all of those fields and a major reason why is Adam Jones. The atmosphere that Jones created with Tool's music starting in the 90s and then beyond still hooks people. People associate Tool with Maynard and that's fair, but Jones really should be just as known with the name Tool for the original visions he has put to the band both live and on packaging, and then for every single low, thick riff and melody he has played starting with Opiate, Undertow, and Anima. The wild signatures this man is capable of playing at switching up in perfect transition is an inspiration for other guitarists. Tool has the atmosphere and tone that many bands can't achieve with two guitarists while Adam Jones is all Tool needs. The playing is complex to perform and Jones makes everything sound fluid regardless of how straightforward or experimental he gets in a song. From the groove of Anima to the riffs in 46 and 2, you know the guitar work is always going to be hypnotic because of what Jones can do. Pearl Jam started with 10, and for many 90s fans, rock fans, music fans in general, that album was enough to put Mike McCready in the discussion. Think of how much he delivered through the decade on several Pearl Jam albums. Further proof, McCready was one of the most underestimated from that era. It's natural to think of Eddie Vedder when you think of Pearl Jam, but the association really should be with someone like Mike McCready as well. His playing was able to convey so many emotions expressed through different solos and riffs, soft and low, loud and flashy, McCready could do it all. As the decade went on, in Verses and Yield came out, McCready proved how versatile he was as Pearl Jam would change from pure grunge to adapting so much more. McCready's adapting to different effects and techniques helped Pearl Jam evolve with time and never once did the guitar work feel phoned in. It's a hard choice between Stone Gossard and Mike McCready, but I had to choose one and McCready's lead work through different styles put an exclamation point on Pearl Jam's music through the decade. Alice in Chains was arguably the heaviest of grunge bands, and a big reason why is Jerry Cantrell, who if you ask will say that Alice in Chains was metal. Regardless of who was classifying the subgenre, Cantrell's work with the guitar was iconic in the early 90s to the point that he could elongate a solo for minutes and no one would mind. Lane Staley was a one-of-a-kind talent, and when Cantrell and Staley harmonized, it was magic. But without Cantrell's ability on the guitar as a true lead, I don't know if Alice in Chains would have been the complete package they were. And in some ways still are, he's still going. It's the contributions from Cantrell to so many of the heavy anthems of the 90s and playing longer dynamic solos and riffs without shredding a mile a minute, but rather establishing a groove and riding it into the sun. Jerry Cantrell knew how to have a payoff with just about any song through his guitar work. I could just list off some of my favorite riffs from songs like Alice in Chains off Facelift, Dirt, the self-titled, and I think that would be enough proof for making the list. His writing ability, along with dynamic and creative structure, set Cantrell apart for many grunge peers. Pantera floundered in the 80s. There's no way around this fact, and to be honest, it was not due to the skill of one of the best guitarists ever. But when the new decade started and Cowboys From Hell came out, Dimebag Daryl was able to prove himself with an aggressive style by a guitar-slinging cowboy. Aggressive is the best way to describe Dimebag's style. It continued from Cowboys From Hell to vulgar display of power and far beyond driven, and that was only the first half of the decade. Dimebag was shredding so fiercely that he riled up a generation to help get a metal band have the number one selling album on Bill Billboard 200. People may talk about how Pantera found their sound when Anselmo joined. Well, Pantera never would have been anything without Dimebag and Vinny, especially Dimebag's endless southern style of metal that actually gave credence to the motto of you don't mess with Texas. Dimebag Darrell was a revolutionary musician live with every riff he played, the ferocious style he had along with the ability to shift gears to a dominating solo and back to the heaviest of riffs was iconic. One of the best guitarists ever and taken way too early. 
Some will be furious that Tom Morello is the best guitarist of the 90s on this list because they don't agree with the message of Rage Against the Machine. Those same people are the ones screaming you need to separate the art from the artist when talking about Kid Rock or Ted Nugent. Regardless of where you stand, it doesn't change Tom Morello being one of the best guitarists ever. And for my money, the best guitarist from the 90s. Isolating the guitar track from almost any Rage Against the Machine song and hearing the precision and fast creativity going beyond frets and chords to pulling the jack out and scraping that against the strings and board, it proved him as much innovator as guitarist, and in a band that knew how to accentuate him. Every solo crafted to a different speed and a playing style combining metal, punk, and hip-hop. Most successful guitarists are lucky to be recognized as being great at one of those styles. Morello played to make it work with every sound he made. In the 90s, Rage Against the Machine was unstoppable, and Tom Morello made the band stand out for the best reasons. This is all outside of future ventures like Audio Slave and Solo Work. Tom Morello's body of work from Rage Against the Machine's self-titled debut to the Battle of Los Angeles, every time Morello played live or in studio, it put other guitarists to shame. Some guitarists play creatively, some with aggression, and some with flawless timing. Morello had all of that to the point that he could stand on stage in a collar shirt with long strings and everyone knew how great he was going to be. I don't think the 90s music scene would have been as strong without the names listed here. I also get that there were many others that contributed in huge ways, but I did my best to narrow this down. I welcome more suggestions on how you would rank the best guitarists of the 90s, but remember that if you are truly upset that your favorite guitar from the 90s wasn't listed or you're upset with the ranking, please know that I did it intentionally despite you. I hope this list keeps you up at night.